Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Aurélie Nage from Glasgow, uh, reporting for Run Now at ACR, ACR 2021. Today, I have the great privilege to be with Professor Ernest Choi. Um, we, we from Cardiff, we had, you know, during this conference, a lot of um, data coming about jack inhibitor safety, uh, especially to facilitate with the oral surveillance um, data presented yesterday at the plenary session. So um, what are your thoughts on, on all these? Uh, so, uh, so number one, I think in order to interpret the oral surveillance data, we should understand the trial in context. So obviously oral surveillance is a safety trial. So, and it is event driven and is looking at potential adverse event in a high risk group of patients. So it, it is selective high risk patients. So it's not absolutely 100% representative of every single patient that we see in clinical settings. So that is an important context. The second thing uh, is that the safety signal was in comparison with TNF inhibitor. And I think in the session we just heard from the FDAs, some of the thinking and guidance is based on the fact that if one has a choice between JAK inhibitor and TNF inhibitor, with the current level of evidence, they are giving a guidance that perhaps we should try a TNF inhibitor first. And in the session, they were pretty clear. They think that JAK inhibitors should be used after TNF inhibitor failure patients. So that provides the context of benefit versus harm. Uh, I think it's also important to say that my interpretation of the oral surveillance data is that uh, the relative risk against TNF inhibitor was shown in the study against a various uh, number of adverse events, but the absolute risk remains very small. So there's a relative increased risk compared with TNF inhibitor, but if you look at the absolute event rate, it is still small. So it is a manageable risk. So in the patient who you don't have a choice of choosing TNF inhibitor, the choice of a JAK inhibitor would be appropriate because the the benefit outbreak the small increase in risk. And I think this is the FDA's interpretation of the risk. So it's not that it is an enormously risky drug that we need to withdraw the treatment. Um, obviously, we need to think about what do we do in high risk patients, patients who have a previous uh, risk factor. And I think that depends on what the patient had trial before. So we all know that some patients are highly refractory, they have tried multiple treatment. If they're getting benefit, and as long as they understand there is a small increase in risk, the patient may choose to continue with treatment, just accepting that, that risk because untreated RA is associated with higher mortality and mobility. So that's a, that is one extreme. But if the patient has lots of risk factors and there are other options, then the choice is a different one. So I think ultimately this is going to be a decision based on shared decision-making between clinicians and patients. It's not that JAK inhibitors are all bad. Uh, there are some risk, like all treatment, is about how to assess the benefit versus the risk. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, it's it's interesting, isn't it? I'm gonna be like almost a bit provocative here, but can we even compare what based on what you were saying, not based on what you're saying, but like thinking of the idea that uh, it's compared to TNF inhibitors. Could we not consider maybe or suppose that maybe TNF inhibitors reduce cardiovascular risk and maybe not JAK inhibitors increase it? Would that be a, something we could maybe consider? What do you think about that? Well, that is a very good point. And obviously there are lots of evidence that TNF inhibitors do reduce uh, cardiovascular risk. Um, so it is fair enough to say that perhaps the effect of JAK inhibitors on cardiovascular prevention is only marginally less than TNF in inhibitor. That would be uh, one uh, interpretation. I think slightly more challenging would be to think about the other side effect profile like VTE or, uh, or malignancy. So I think because it's not just one particular side effect profile, but a number of risk factor is a little bit hard. But 
what you said is definitely true, that active rheumatoid arthritis is associated with many risk factors, increased cardiovascular mortality, people can get infections, and they can have increased risk of lymphoproliferative disease. So because our surveillance is a relative comparison, we don't have a placebo-treated patient in this group. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is why they decided that it's, it's not bad enough for us to think about it's such a bad drug, we need to withdraw it. But yeah. if you have an option, then perhaps you should try TNF inhibitor first. Definitely. No, thank you. And I think it's great also that you have these insights, you know, from uh, maybe uh, regulatory um, bodies as well. Uh, I'm wondering, so should we uh, maybe start thinking about stratifying our patients in our practice when it comes to, you know, first drug or maybe after a biologic failure? Should we think, oh, right, maybe in that patient that is, you know, 65 years old, smoker, maybe we should go for a second biologic and not a jack inhibitor. Could that be something that we would need to implement maybe in practice? Well, definitely at the ACI, we saw many subgroup analysis of oral surveillance and patients who are at high risk of adverse event tend to have high risk. So older patients, and there are many subgroup analysis of patients who are over 50, who are smokers, who seem to have a higher risk. Um, and of course, we know that people who have a previous adverse event are always at risk of another serious adverse event. And in fact, uh, we, we presented a study a few days ago looking at whether inflammatory arthritis patients are at risk of in, uh, severe outcome. And guess what? If they have a previous serious infection, it automatically predicts them having a worse outcome. It's, 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 it's a slightly uh, sort of scientifically intuitive argument. If you're at risk, then you're always at greater risk. So, so I think that is a very good question. I think the, the, the issue is that we don't have an absolute threshold because many of our patients have multiple risk factors. So they don't always operate on its own. So I think at this moment in time, we know some of the risk factors and it's going to be something that we need to work on. I mean, for sure, uh, getting patients to lose weight, getting them to stop smoking is going to be very important for the general health. I should also emphasize that I think in the FDA's discussion, they are not saying that they know for sure that uh, the, this side effect in oral surveillance is considered a class effect. But what, what they have said is that because they share similar, of, similar mechanism of action, at least some, then until there are definitive evidence that this is not a class effect, they will consider it as a class effect at this moment in time. Right. That is a very important point, actually. Thank you for raising that. Um, I, I just for our audience, very briefly, I realized that I have not given any abstract numbers. So very briefly uh, for everyone, uh, oral surveillance yesterday on uh, MACE and, and TOFA was uh, abstract 958. And tomorrow, um, oral surveillance on cancer is 1940 and on MVT is 1941. Um, and I mean, um, Professor Shoy, thank you so much. Okay, you're think, welcome. Nice talking to you. Amazing. Okay, <laughs> likewise. Bye. Bye. <laughs>